What's up, guys? I'm Rico Torres from Michigan, in San Antonio. I got Ziva Alicia, we're from Michigan, San Antonio, Texas. Welcome to GT Food and Drink. Guys, today we're gonna to do a class on Mole Poblano, one of the most quintessential moles in Mexico. We're gonna break down all the ingredients and explore Mexico's history through those ingredients. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. Love the energy, love the energy, love the energy. You know, you guys did a great job. The attempt was to say hola amigos, but it's like, oh, God, 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 God. it's okay. We know our own. Oh, yeah, let's say good afternoon in our different languages, Nigerian. E caso. But not only a caso, I said your own language is, oh, you know, a multilingual. Guys, it's so good to be here. I think we're going to have an amazing time. This masterclass is called A Glance of Mexico's History Through Its Ingredients. Now, whenever we think about Mexican food, we always think about Tex-Mix. Tex-Mix. Tacos, salsa, what else? Quesadilla, tortilla. <laughs> but guys, I'm here to tell you that that is not only Mexican food. Our chefs are coming in all the way from San Antonio in America. And honestly, these guys are ready to show us what it means to taste original, authentic Mexican through food and also to give us the history through ingredients. We're going way back. As you can see, we have an amazing display right behind me. And I'm so excited. I want enthusiasm, excitement, and of course, for us to continue to engage with our chefs because they are coming in all the way from America. So jet lag is doing them. You guys know that, right? All right, so we're going to get started. Now, I'd like to introduce our two chefs, Rico Torres and Diego Galicia, all the way from San Antonio. Mr. Garcia. Two amazing chefs. They look the part. They're ready to throw down right here at the GT Co. Food and Drink Masterclass. And, you know, earlier we'd been talking, and I was trying to, you know, practice the name of their restaurants, and I think I got it right. It's Mishli. Mishli. Perfect. Yes. So, chefs, how are you guys doing? Hey, hey. hola, amigos. Hola. hola a todos. <laughs> Buenas tardes. We got it. Like a class you know, I took Spanish here. a little bit. Let me not disgrace myself, but um, me llama es yeah. me, llamo. me llamo. Me llamo. Yeah. You see, I said, let me not disgrace myself. Guys, Perfect. I saw that you were out in town in Nigeria yesterday having a little bit of suya. What did you guys think about it? It's oh, incredible. I love it. I love yeah, it. incredible. The I flavors, really there's a lot of similarities between Nigerian food and Mexican food. Very strong flavors. So, yeah, it's, 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 been, it's been awesome. Yeah. We're so excited. I know you guys want to get started, and we have very little time. Um, you know, so we're going to interact as much as possible. But talk to us a little bit about when you're saying the history of Mexico through ingredients. What does that mean, and why did you guys choose that title? Well, Mexico is, Mexico is so complex. We have the Mesoamerican time uh, before the Spanish arrived. Then we have the period where the Europeans are there, and it becomes a different Mexico. Um, am I on? You guys can hear me, Sound right? good? Can you guys hear yeah. Sound yeah. all right? Yeah? All right. Okay, he's good. But, but basically, it, it's so complex, it, the history is so long, that it's almost impossible to just confine it into one state or one region or one dish. It's certainly not Tex-Mex, not the abbreviated Tex-Mex. Uh, that's, you know, we talk about Texas Mexican all the time at the restaurant. It's a whole other master class. Um, but it's, it's, it, there's so many ingredients, and it's an agricultural cradle to the world. A lot of people don't know that Mexico gave cacao to the world. Vanilla, chiles, corn, tomatoes. And in, in return, I mean, Mexico has also received a lot of ingredients that have affected it from all over the world. You pull on that thread, and that fabric of human history starts to unravel, and you see how interconnected everything is. All it's right, beautiful. chefs, let's get to cooking. I know we're excited, so I'm going to let you guys take it away. Awesome. All right, guys, so we're going to talk about what we do at the restaurant and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, Mishli means cloud in Nahuatl, the Aztec language. In Mexico, we have a lot of indigenous groups, and the Aztecs were probably one of the most important at the time. Uh, the reason why we named our restaurant Cloud is because the menu travels like a cloud. Every three months, we make a menu based on our region in Mexico. We have uh, 32 states in Mexico. They're all the independent states, and every state offers different things to eat. Right? So in Lagos, for example, you have a certain type of cuisine, but a different state, things change a little bit. Uh, in Mexico, it's just the same. So every three months, we make a menu based on our region of the country. Sometimes it can be a place in time and history. Sometimes it can be a specific place within a region. And for example, right now, our menu is focused on Yucatan, which is the peninsula by the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico meet. And Yucatan, is a, it's a port state. Uh, it's the ocean, the bounty of fish, um, the wild game like deer. So 
Um, that way, the guests can experience Mexico, you know, more than just Mexican food. It's regional food. They can see that the country is bigger than what a lot of people think it is. So, 32 individual states. Every state offers something different, and that's where we broke it down. So, like a cloud moves, our menu moves through Mexico like a cloud. Michelin means cloud, the Aztec language. So, we pay not much to that, right? Uh, we have a 10 course tasting menu. Our guests arrive, and it's 10 individual courses uh, that tell the story of the place, right? Uh, we made a menu one time that was a place in history uh, based on the conquest of Mexico by the Spanish. Uh, Mexico was a colony of the Spain, Spain at some point, like probably the rest of the world, they just took over everything. So we celebrated that introduction of uh, European ingredients to Mexico, right? Before the Spanish arrived, there were no chickens, no pigs, no cows, no horses, right? So the Aztecs, the first time they saw a horse, they believed the man and the horse were one creature. They had no idea what it was. So they were going to battle, stabbing the horse, thinking they would kill the rider, because they had no clue what that was. There was no animal like a horse in the Americas. Um, and in return, like Chevrico said, we gave the world tomatoes. Uh, corn is huge staple in, 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 in the world. Um, so we've been kind of like trading, you know, ingredients back and forth for a long time with Europe and, uh, and the rest of the world. So we're going to talk about, about that today, and Chevrico is going to tell you what, what mole is all about. All right, guys. So let's talk about mole, first of all, because while I've been here for the last couple of days, I brought that word up, and people just kind of gave me a blank look. So I thought it was a little bit more of one of these sauces where everybody knew what it was. But it's one of the most complex sauces that you can make in Mexico. Uh, the one that we're gonna present to you today is mole poblano, which is probably the most quintessential. Uh, so much so that the Mexican government actually has a, a written recipe uh, dedicated to that mole. But like in any household, sauces change, moles change. Not all of them have chocolate. Some of them are green, white, black, red, yellow. I mean, it's hundreds of different styles of moles. The word itself comes from the, the Nahuatl word muyi, um, to, to grind. Who knows what guacamole is, right? Okay, guacamole is the same thing. Avocados that have been mashed up, and that's basically the root of these words. Um, but to have a mole, you need a few simple ingredients. You definitely need some chiles. You're going to need some spices. You're going to need some binders like nuts or seeds, um, and in, some, in many cases, some kind of fruit. Uh, chocolate, like I said, it's, it's not for everything. But with this mole, it is. This is a very special one. The mole that we're talking about today, mole poblano, it dates back almost 300 years. Then there's two stories about it. One story says that the Archbishop of Spain was coming into Mexico, and we're talking about he's coming through Veracruz, which is uh, at one point in time one of the most important ports of entry in the world. And through Veracruz, they would cross into Puebla, and Puebla is the last stop before you get into Mexico City. And so in Puebla, the Duke was going to um, Los Angeles, the, the convent called uh, San, Los, San Angeles, unexpected. The nuns were freaking out. We, don't know, we didn't know what they were going to serve him. And they started throwing ingredients together of what they had, chocolates, seeds, uh, nuts, spices, chiles. Yeah, and the only, because if you notice, a lot of those things don't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense. So if I'm a nun in a convent and the bishop is coming, and you have peanuts and, I mean, what do you make, right? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, and so they, they, they put together what they had, a very humble offering. The only protein that they had that day was an old turkey, so they killed that. By the way, the Nahuatl word for turkey is uh, wakolote, which means clown bird, because of its clown feathers, I guess. <laughs> um, and he loved it. He loved it. He's like, what is this called? One of the nuns reportedly said it's called mole. And that's when the name stuck. That's when it finally stuck. And for the last 300 years, that's what it's been known as in Mexico. Um, another story says that, that one of the friars in the convent created this mole. And he prayed for inspiration. And all of a sudden, a wind blew all these spices that were on a shelf into a pot. And then that's how that was created. I don't know about that one. I think the first one is a little bit more, probably more accurate, makes a little more sense. But either way, it's become a very important, very quintessential element of the Mexican gastronomy. And that's what we're going to dive into today. We're going to break down all the ingredients and trace them back to where they came from and see how, how all of the, this concoction of ingredients somehow ended up in Mexico to create these dishes. And just like, just like every other place in the world that has ingredients that have been brought in from other places, you have recipes and certain items are replaced by other ingredients and then these recipes take, you know, over centuries they start to change and you start to see new dishes and 
people move from, from different areas of the world to, you know, like some of these started in the Middle East, and then they end up in Spain, then they end up in the Caribbean, then they end up in the Middle Mexico. And here we have this mole. It's, it's an incredible story. So let's get started. We're going to start, I guess today, the first one we're going to start off with is uh, talk about the with chiles. The chiles. So mole really is a celebration food, right? You make mole when you're celebrating something. When somebody's getting married or a baptism or a first communion, mole is that celebration of food you want to make because uh, it's so complex. Uh, it's so lengthy in time to make, and it's really the crown jewel of Mexican food, right? So mole poblano is it's, it's as good as it gets from Mexico. So the base of Mexican uh, sauces, really all of them, are chiles, right? Peppers. Um, you know, in Caribbean food, you use uh, habaneros or scotch bonnets. But in Mexico, we have this wealth of chiles, and we have them in different shapes and forms. We have them fresh, we have them dried, we have them smoked and then dried. So chiles are a big thing um, when it comes to Mexican food. We have here a few dried chiles that we brought from home. Um, and the root of a chiles in Mexico uh, really comes from using them for warfare. When the Aztecs were fighting other tribes, other groups in the country, they would burn piles of peppers and they would waft them with fans so the smoke could hit their enemies and would put them in their, stuff them in their tracks, right? Um, to discipline children, if you have a kid that's kind of like crying or like, you know, misbehaving, you would put some chili in their mouth so they would stop crying and they would stop, you know, doing evil things in your house. <laughs> so chiles have all these purposes that are not eating intended, right? They use them for warfare, for disciplining, for cer ceremonial uh, occasions as well. So chiles are really the kings of ingredients in Mexico. Yes. I'm going to go through a few that we're going to make, uh, put in the mole. So we have here first, we have some chipotles. And a chipotle pepper is a jalapeño. And I think a jalapeño is the most known pepper you've ever seen out of Mexico. It's this big green, like, kind of, you know, long pepper. A little bit spicy, not, not too spicy. But then we uh, dry them and then smoke them and they look like this, right? Like little, like little raisins. That's a chipotle. Uh, then we have the pasillas. It's a longer, a longer chile, right? Beautiful red color. Uh, we have... Um, that was the guajillo. Guajillo. We have anchos right here. It's a poblano, mm -hmm. correct? So... But again, we have the green version of the chiles. They go through a process where they're dried and smoked, and they become something else afterwards. The right. flavor in these chiles, think of a raisin, kind of like you know, creamy, rich flavor. They're, they're absolutely incredible chiles. So, Are again, any of these peppers able to be edible raw? Or well, is that going to cause a fire technically, in the Technically, mouth? they're not raw right now. They're dried, and they are smoked. So when you want to use these, uh, two applications. One, you can... Sometimes what we'll do is we'll put this in a dry blender and just blend the whole thing, stems and seeds, and have a beautiful powder to season your food. Or like the powder for for the uh, the suya, right? It's the same thing. Come you know, on. we make a, a powder out of the chiles and we season stuff at the restaurant. Yeah. We always have salt, and then we have the powdered chiles that we can finish off anything. Yeah. The beautiful thing uh, we had suya last night, and that powder is just like. The most incredible Did it thing, hit so. you hard? Did it hit no, you hard? I'm Mexican, so I can't so do you, that. So you stuff, handled like, it. Look, yeah. they handled it like, geez, they're not on you, boo, you guys. See, but yeah. the, the thing to notice here is that we're no so, not so far apart, right? Even Mexico so far, our flavors, our food binds us together, right? Even though we're from totally different, different ends of the world, it's like that pleasure of that heat of that spice it kind of like binds us all together like a big happy family. And I so. completely agree because there's something on that table that most of us love. We all, we're all seeing it, Avi. What is it, guys? What's on the table that we love? Plantain. We're excited to get to that. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. So we're going to go through our list of, of ingredients. So the yeah. beautiful story of plantains in Mexico, we'll touch on that. So that covers chiles. Um, well, if I may. Yeah, no, please. The beautiful thing about chiles is that it's not just for heat. These are all different uh, levels of heat, different levels of flavor. And that's the most important thing when you're creating salsas and moles uh, or any kind of dish in Mexico. For example, this is, used to be a chile chilhualque, dark green, long, now it's a chile pasilla. Then it's smoked, it's called chile pasilla mije, and it's one of the most incredible flavors to have that. Um, this is chile chipotle, it could be chile morita, and that's just the difference between when it was ripened, I mean, when it was dried. Uh, if it's dried when it's green, it's chipotle. If it's dried when it's red, it's uh, morita. Um, it's confusing, but yeah. you'll, you'll get the, the changes of the, the name changes as the chile progresses. Exactly. Chile poblano turns into chile ancho. When it's green, when it's red, it's chile mulato. And that one has a more complex flavor, more like coffee and licorice, and that, that definitely raisiny flavors come out. And it's a combination of mixing these together. You put an ancho, a chipotle, and a pasilla, and this is the holy trinity right here. So, you know, that, that in itself is like the beginning of a lot of bases. 
we don't even keep black pepper. At my house, we don't keep black pepper by the stove. It's salt and dried chili powder. And that's what we use for everything. My son eats all of that stuff, and he's super excited about it. When, and I think that when we have foods that don't have it, he's missing those flavors. And so, yeah, it's, it's not just about heat. Making salsas that are hot just for the sake of them being hot with no flavors is, is, sounds crazy to me. You know, so I don't know when some <laughs> chefs are like, oh, it's cayenne and ghost peppers and scorpion peppers. Like, you haven't met Yoruba people yet. <clears throat> right. It's, it's one it's, tribe in Nigeria that's obsessed with pepper. They like to eat and they <sniffs> snot is running down their nose as yeah, they're eating. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's fun, but it's not a frat party. Like, it's not. It's, it's not to see who's the most macho. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an enjoyable heat, right? That pleasure of just spicy, you can't stop eating it. And in Mexico, that's, they say we're a bit masochist in Mexico because we like that pain so much. But it's uh, something that we thoroughly enjoy. So that's chiles. We're going to move on to almonds now. Okay. Almonds. Obviously, everybody's really familiar with these. We start to see almonds in Western Asia. Um, and, you know, Europeans are finding these when they're following the silk routes through Turkey and through Greece. Um, even in the Bible, this is mentioned, where Canaan has his staff that is made out of uh, almond tree bark. And when he, when he stomps it, almonds come out. And this is kind of a way of saying that God approves this because these are so, such a wonderful ingredient. But really, these almonds get grown on trees. They're brought into Mexico by the Spanish uh, around the 16th century, uh, by, the, by the Franciscan monks. And, you know, and, and the church plays a huge role after the conquistadores have invaded and, and really torn everything down. The church comes in, and the church was always there to play a peacekeeping mission, to quell the violence, and to really start to work with the communities. And, but with them, they bring everything that they're used to, know, used to uh, growing and eating. I mean, how are you going to move across the world and not have some of your local favorites with you? So they bring things like almonds with them, almond trees, apricot trees, peach trees. Um, and they really take root in Baja California. Uh, now, about 180 years ago, California used to be Mexico. So was Texas and New Mexico and Arizona. And all that southern part of the United States used to be Mexico until the, until the Treaty of Hidalgo, mm -hmm. when Mexico signed over almost 50, over 50% of its own country to the United States. And now they're states. I mean, I live in Texas, so you know, I'm, I'm happy for all of that. But it just kind of goes to show how blurred these lines are. You take away a political line or a political boundary, and what you just have is this land and people living off the land and surviving off the land. And when you start introducing ingredients like this, even though they didn't originate there, they, they, find place, they find homes in these areas. And so almonds take shape, and they become very popular in, as flour, as uses in, in sauces, of course in candy, and it just kind of goes on and on from there. So another big part of mole, right? So we have the chiles, we have the almonds. Now we're starting to notice that these things are not all native to Mexico, even though they're part of a very important dish in Mexico. So we're going to do uh, pecans. And pecans, we you know, know them as nueces in Mexico. I don't know if you guys have pecans here in, in, in your country, but um, these are native to the Mississippi Valley in the, in the United States, right? And then pecans became a big trading thing back in the 16th century uh, when people noticed that, one, they were very tasty, and two, they could make money out of growing these trees. Yep. Now you can find them anywhere, anywhere in Texas. Uh, my wife and I have two in our house, uh, and every year we get this rain of pecans just falling in the backyard. Uh, and they're just everywhere. Like the squirrels love being in our house because they just like to eat all these things and they bury them all over the property. So pecans are delicious. Um, they're very creamy, very nutty. Uh, they're a great thickener for salsa. So that's why it finds its place in mole because it's so, uh, it's so rich in flavor and creamy. Um, so yeah, big staple of, uh, of the United States. A uh, big part of northern Mexico as well. Yeah, especially for native Texans, for Native mm -hmm. Americans living in Texas, in that area, this is a huge part of that diet. And now you'll have guys like, like grandpas, when these trees, when these nuts hit the ground, they love to sit out there with their nutcrackers and just cracking nuts all day long and, you know, telling stories. But, of course, pecan pie. I think like three years ago, there was a shortage of pecans in Texas because China was buying so much. Mm -hmm. And so the, sp the price skyrocketed for all of us. And it was just nuts. But. And then you find them in applications like desserts. They make uh, pecan pie. In Texas, it's huge. You find it anywhere. It's very traditional. Uh, you can find uh, candies, they dip them in chocolate. So applications both in savory and in sweets. Uh, so pecans, uh, that's, the, uh, that's one other ingredient of the, uh, of the, of the mole. So we're going to move now to uh, sesame peanuts. seeds. Actually, we skipped peanuts. Let's go jump back on oh, that Oh, peanuts. One. Yeah, peanuts. Peanuts. Too. Me vale cacahuate. It means, it literally translates to, it means peanuts. Or a way of saying, I don't care. <laughs> 
Obviously, people who said that didn't realize how important this was to the diet uh, and the gastronomy in Mexico. You see, you really, you, you find peanuts in uh, South America, specifically Peru and Brazil, but they would grow as far north as central Mexico. Uh, when the Portuguese arrive, they take these back with them, and then eventually they bring them to West Africa. They become a big part of the diet. Uh, here, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. and um, yep. we call them yep. ground nuts in Nigeria right. because they're so similar to ground nuts. And as a matter yeah. of fact, Europeans didn't really understand what this was because these are nuts that didn't grow on trees, mm -hmm. so they felt that it wasn't important. Um, Africans brought them with them to the United States and started planting them in the South, w where they were growing rice, but they were also growing peanuts. And now this is a huge crop for that whole area, and it's become something super important. In Mexico, this can be added to just about everything, especially candies. Mm -hmm. Candies made out of this stuff is, is incredible. And you mix it with any kind of stuff, any kind of drink. In Veracruz, there's a cocktail made with peanuts. Uh, peanuts and rum and vanilla, and it just, it's just delicious, like a peanut butter. I mean, I don't know about the hangover with that one, but it sounds delicious. So. <laughs> uh, something familiar from the area, sesame seeds. Sesame seeds are endemic to Africa. They've been used through Asia and Egypt thousands of years ago to make flour. Um, they have their applications as one well Mexican food. The really cool thing about sesame seeds is that in Mexico we have uh, Afro indigenous uh, communities and they brought with them uh, sesame seeds, uh, helping the state of Guerrero in Mexico become one of the largest producers of sesame seeds in the country. Uh, it's an incredible thing, widely used through Africa and Asia. Like I said, the Egyptians used to use it as well. Uh, you can grind it, make a flour out of it. Um, in Mexico, we coat candies with it as well, uh, both applications in, uh, in savory and sweet. So, um, yeah, sesame seeds are hugely important when it comes to mole. Where are we at? Cinnamon? Yep, we're cinnamon. moving to cinnamon. Cinnamon, we're going to Sri Lanka with this. True, true cassia cinnamon. Um, of course, this is another one of those stories where you see, you see these spices um, developing in the early world, and then they're moving, they're moving on across the world. So, in Baghdad, Muslims take on this these recipes of uh, these Persian recipes that are very complex and almost a thousand years old and they become part of the gastronomy of the Muslims and then eventually they move on to other Muslim communities specifically that Iberian the southern Iberian Peninsula southern Spain all that part of southern Spain where the Moors had invaded Spain and for almost for almost 500 years it had a huge role in what the food was like there and so this this complex this complex uh, amalgamation of spices, I mean, cinnamon being right at the top of it. Egyptians use this to, um, they use this for medicinal purposes, they use this in their embalming. Uh, but in Mexico, we put it on just about everything. And, so, and, I, and that's no lie, I mean, from, from the chocolates, to the atoles, to the moles, to the, to the salsas, to your steaks, you will find that application just about everywhere. Uh, it's kind of interesting because that's one spice I see that we don't really cook with it per se. We usually use it for like baking and things like that in Nigeria mainly. Yeah, no, so we mix, we have a beautiful drink at the restaurant. It's called a Paloma. It comes from Jalisco. It's a uh, basically grapefruit soda or grapefruit juice mixed with tequila. We add a cinnamon simple syrup to it. It's fantastic. You think of this as a warm spice, but have you had this with watermelon? Well, actually, or, some people use this for Zobo, right? Yes, yeah. that's very so, true. Yeah, People do use it for Zobo. It's, I mean, in, at home in my tea kettle, I always have cinnamon sticks in there all the time. My wife drinks it uh, just straight. I, put it, I use it to brew my coffee. And it's always in the house. Sounds yum. So, yes, the Spanish brought this into Mexico, but not through the Caribbean. 1565, uh, the Spanish galleon San Pablo is touring from Alcapulco to the Philippines. So right around this time is when... This is, this is what I consider the time that the whole world became, became connected because that route from Alcapulco over the Pacific, a six-month voyage called the Torno Viaje or the turnaround voyage, landing in the, Philippine and bringing, in the Philippines and bringing back these all kinds of ingredients, all kinds of Asian ingredients. So it, it wasn't just Filipino, it was also Chinese. They would bring back things like uh, Chinese uh, lacquered woodwork and silks and spices. They brought back Chinese men to work and build railroads in Mexico. And then a little bit down the road, they sent them back and then allowed them to come back. And it was just like, that's a whole other story. But it's interesting how that little, uh, that little part of human history is what really tied the whole world together. Because before then, nobody had crossed the Pacific. People had crossed the Atlantic, some by mistake, and then all of a sudden we discovered the new world. But nobody had actually made the connection that you could go all the way around the world traveling this way. I mean, 
it's scary enough to, to think about traveling across the Atlantic for a few months, but traveling over the Pacific, which is much, much bigger, is even Thank more Thank God for planes, scary. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, so this is Sri Lanka, and it's moving, it's moving east, and that's how it ends up in Mexico. But now it's, I mean, it's a huge Mexican staple. They would take the cinnamon and take it back to Spain, but the majority of it ended up in Mexico and became a huge part of the diet there, of, of all the recipes that we do. So again, the only thing native to Mexico so far in this sauce is the peppers, right? That we've yeah. talked about. That's it. Everything else is from all over the world. Uh, the next one is uh, cloves or clavos de olor, or in Mexico we call them uh, nails that smell, right? They look like, like little nails that you could, you know, use in woodwork. Uh, and these cloves are actually from Akulu Islands in Indonesia, right? Which Mexico and Indonesia have, have nothing in common when it comes to geography. It's so far from Mexico. So again, this talks about the power of trade in those times. Um, cloves have been used, you know, thousands of years, uh, 1,500 years before Christ was born in food already. Um, so they're very small, very pungent in smell, very strong in flavor. Um, so cloves are a big part of, uh, of Mexican food, um, not only mole, but in a lot of different applications. Um, so yeah, big part of the trading routes. Um, the Dutch, uh, the Europeans were the ones that brought it to Mexico during their trades with other different islands in the Pacific. So again, from the Maluku Islands in, the, in Indonesia, this little, uh, little spice made its way to Mexico. Right, where are we at? Moving on to... Allspice. All spice. Here we go. Allspice, or Jamaican berries, or uh, pimienta grande. Or pimienta tabasqueña. Yeah. Pimienta, Do yeah. you guys know why they call it allspice? Like, I've always wondered. Yes. Whenever I buy it, I'm just like... That's a great is question. Is it going to spice great all question. of my food? Like, does this mean this is the only thing I have to put inside? Yes. 1621, the British coined this allspice because it had all the flavors of thyme and uh, black peppercorns and nutmeg and cinnamon. So it was confusing, and, and they, they, that misnomer of allspice uh, is where it came from. But it really originates, you see it in the Caribbean, and then you see it in the southern parts of Mexico, namely um, uh, Yucatan, Chiapas, Quintana Roo, um, Tabasco, all those southern areas is where you really see allspice. The Mayans used it for medicinal purposes, um, but they also used it to flavor their chocolate. So, and we'll get to chocolate here in a little bit, but that means that before sugar was added, you know, the ancient, the ancient Americans were, were using stuff like herbs or spices or in some cases even salt to flavor their chocolate. And chiles, of course, would go into that yeah. and to, and to flavor all, in, all those things. And so the allspice is now the second ingredient that we have that is going to be endemic to this area of Mexico. All right, next one. Uh, just look familiar to anybody? Uh, okay. Sorry, so. sorry. Let me. Uh, be careful. I don't know if it bites or not. Oh, <laughs> This is a holy grail in our land. Please, sir. Uh, yeah, so this is a, this is a gift from, from, from you to us. Um, plantains, huge in Mexico. In the markets, you find plantains any, everywhere. Um, big staple of the country as well. A lot of sauces. Um, so plantains, uh, they come from a plant, not a tree, right? And the, it's a flowering plant. And the females are the ones that make the, bana the, the plantains or the bananas. Um, although they're related to, to bananas, they're uh, lower in sugar and higher in starch, lower in, in moisture as well. Um, and the thing about these this, uh, this plantains, they made the way to Mexico through uh, Afro-indigenous uh, immigrants that came to Tabasco, uh, to Veracruz in the Gulf Coast of Mexico. They planted them because they noticed the terroir or the land, the climate, lended itself very well to growing plantains. So we have them in Mexico all over the markets. They go in different sauces. and. Such an uh, important part of our cuisine in Mexico. So thank you for uh, allowing and us to have. Saying thank you, we say yeah, welcome. Yeah, yeah we we, uh, <laughs> we we use them very very often very, very in, our, in our cuisine. I had uh, mosa today as part of my small chops, and just just one of those things that is like really similar to the stuff that you'll see in Mexico, like croquetas or mm -hmm. croquettes or. Uh, did you, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just the similarities are there. It, and we're very lucky to have uh, a lot of African communities in Mexico that they stay there, they thrive, and they started making food from, from their lands, which could be Nigeria, West Africa, East Africa. So we're lucky to have a population in Mexico that's strong, and they get to share these gifts of African cuisine with the rest of the country. Uh -huh. um, and now they mix it with Mexican food. They make empanadas made of the dough of the plantain or dough made with sweet potato. Um, so yeah, it's that very beautiful marriage of, of African food and, and Mexican cuisine. Ready? Cool. That was plantains? Right. Yeah. Moving on to raisins. It's no raisins. I mean, this is not much of a mystery. People have been drying fruits for 3,000 years. I mean, you, you see this, uh, notes of this in early Egypt, 
you see this uh, all over the world, but really it's when the Spanish bring these fruit trees into Mexico, specifically again in this California Baja area, where you start to see the development of, of these dishes being dried. Now Puebla is one of the largest producers of dried fruits, but not just things like raisins, uh, but you also see these other things like mangoes and apricots. pineapples and apricots, uh, papayas, everything is dried. And it's just this beautiful, you can go into these candy stores and kids are excited about dry fruits. I mean, the sugar content is incredible, but still, it's still fruit. <laughs> One of the most important desserts in Mexico is arroz con leche or rice pudding. Uh, basically, rice cooked in like milk and cinnamon and uh, raisins take a big part of uh, the recipe for rice pudding. Very simple to make. It's delicious when it's cold because it gets like this like gelatinous consistency, just yeah. absolutely magical. So good application for raisins. And it, it really goes into that that baroque um, that, that that baroque influence that that is in Mexico, and that that's where you see savory items with sweet items, and you see things like picadillos, which is like a ground beef with chiles and onions and spices and cloves. You add raisins to it, and it has that sweet element to it, and it's delicious. Um, where else did we see that? You, it's um, the arroz con leche as well. Yeah, rice pudding. A rice pudding, a little bit of cinnamon on top because we put it on everything. And then, of course, some golden, some raisins to follow up with that. Uh, in Oaxaca, you see the estofados. Estofado is basically a word for a stew, and it's savory and it's spicy. And you have chicken or turkey on it, and then some raisins. And that, that level of sweetness is just adding these layers that, that really speak to that Spanish influence that has really taken over that Mexican gastronomy. So, so far we've had two indigenous ingredients from Mexico in the mole. We've had a lot of uh, Asian and Indonesian ingredients. We have an African ingredient in the mole as well right now. And then we're gonna talk about onions, and onions are huge in Mexico, all of Latin America. Um, there were two of the most important crops in Europe before they came to Mexico, next to cabbage and beans. Uh, and they were brought by European settlers to the country. We use it in everything, literally, Everything in Mexico has onions, uh, salsas, you know, braces, everything. I don't accept desserts. I don't see a dessert with onions <laughs> ever, but uh, onions are uh, they're a, big, uh, a big part of Mexican cuisine. Yeah. Uh, you see Egyptians using this. You would find mummies that had onions buried inside the cavities. And so while onions aren't exactly native to Mexico, there were strains of onions in Mexico that were a little bit milder. Mm -hmm. So just a couple of fun things with this when you're doing this at home. The white onion is probably the most astringent, most bitter onion of them all until you cook it down. And then it becomes the sweetest onion. So, you know, it's just like, so just like kids. Like, you make them work hard a little bit, they're going to become a lot sweeter in the end. You guys work with onions, and I think every single person here is trying to figure out how do we cut onions and not cry? Like, how? Is it possible? Yes, it's, you need a sharp knife. That's the thing. You don't need to chew gum or wear glasses. You need a sharp <laughs> knife because what's happening is you're bruising the onion when you cut it with a dull knife. So while bruising the onion, it's going to release more juice. Okay. Uh, there was a chef from earlier, Chef Baines. He was cutting you know, onions super, super fast, and he was totally fine. But the knife was really sharp. Last night at the suya spot we went to, uh, it was so good. They would put the meat in uh, like a foil and then cut onion. And I was like, but it's just raw onion, right? It's like, right. big deal, whatever. They wrapped it up super tidy newspaper, got to the hotel. We opened it, and the steam made, yes, that. The steam made the, the, like the onion sweat and get some of the, the chi yeah, it was, it was yes, awesome. So, yeah, it's you know, onions, man. It was just raw onion, and it became like the most delicious thing that we had in the whole thing of, of right. meat, you know? And now you can have like onion jam, which is delicious on yep. a burger. Uh, French we, soup onion is delicious. Right. When we use this for a salsa at the restaurant, we always, we always just put it on the comal and tatemara to, to char. To you roast it, it. Yeah. yeah. Until it's nice and charred and blackened and soft. And it's really integral to the, part, to the way that the salsa tastes if you get it right. Um, oftentimes, we'll take it even further than that. Put the oven on full whack and just let it roast until it's completely charred. And then just mash it down in a blender so we can have an onion powder or an onion ash powder, yeah, an onion ash. And that's a great application when you're finishing off a dish and you just need that one little extra element to, to really bring out the flavors and waking up that whole dish. And so lots of applications here for the, for the beautiful, simple, uh, onion. humble onion. Uh, next up, no introduction, garlic. 
garlic's been used for about 3,000 years before Christ in, in uh, Northern Africa. A uh, big part of Mexican cuisine as well. Uh, it's kind of uh, like a trinity between tomatoes, onion, and, and garlic in Mexico. Uh, also, a lot of medicinal purposes. You know, garlic has been known to treat all these types of ailments and like blood pressure and all these things through the years. So, very important to Mexican food. Again, very ancient ingredient that came from West Africa to Mexico that we used on a, on a, on a daily basis. And now the king of kings. Tomato. Tomato is the Aztec word for tomato. Uh, I don't think that... Sorry, how do you guys say it in Aztec? Tom tomato. Tomato? Uh, mm -hmm. with, an, with an L. Yeah, with an L, tomato. T and then the L, sharp L oh, at the end gotcha. of it. And I think our previous class had a pomodoro sauce, and I, I wouldn't have been possible without this, right? So <laughs> pizza funny. sauce on, on your pizzas, spaghetti sauce, all that, not before the tomato, was discovered in Mexico. Uh, normally, you'll see this eaten in areas because it's a fruit. You'll see it eaten in areas where the temperature is just hotter, and so Mesoamericans were already eating, eating things like tomatoes. Um, you see in Yucatan, the Mayans have a dish called the sikilpak, which literally means pumpkin seed tomato, and the other ingredients are habanero and, and sour orange. But it's like a wonderful dip made out of made out of the, the pumpkin seeds and tomato and habanero and it's just spicy and it's delicious and you can go as spicy as you want and I think it's, it's a wonderful spread. Uh, now, once, once the Spanish arrived, they discovered tomatoes uh, and Hernan Cortez takes, these, takes them back to Europe but only, as, only the seeds for ornamental value to make jewelry out of it. So it still wasn't considered a thing that you would eat. 1590s, um, almost about 70 years after Hernan Cortez is there, uh, the British start planting these, these tomatoes and start eating them, but it soon gets the name for, as poison apple because people would die eating this, namely aristocrat people that used pewter trays. And so the tomato would sit on the pewter trays and suck out all the lead, and then they would get lead poisoning and die, and they would blame it on the tomato, but oh, wow. it was really the dish. And so that's why like, if you have this and you're, you, you, know, you have it on some type of metal that, that is reactive, you're going to get that metallic flavor. And so that's why it's recommended you not to, but, and also obviously because the aristocratic people died from <laughs> it, so we obviously want to avoid all of that. But yeah, where else? So that's a tomato. And now Moving we're going to go into honey. What's that? Honey. Is that Hamilo what you Actually, we're going to get into the chocolate. So I think that this is one of those things where if you're stuck on an island, what are the things that you can take with you? And you have to have some chocolate with you. But one of the most important marriages in Mexico, culinarily wise, is the marriage of chocolate and cinnamon. cinnamon, right? And so here you have what they call Mexican chocolate. This is already sweetened uh, with piloncillo, which is a number of fine sugar, but then you add other ingredients into it. You can add almonds and cinnamon and cloves or allspice. So, but a lot of people don't know that the cacao pod was discovered in Mexico. And it was huge, it was huge for, for Mesoamericans. For as money, it was the food of the gods. Um, Moctezuma, the Aztec emperor, had a harem of about a thousand wives, and he needed cacao every day to keep him strong for. <laughs> to like this is why he should have to one wife, <laughs> right? <laughs> to love them. Uh huh. But way before sugar is added to, to chocolate, and we're talking like the mid 1800s, when uh, in Switzerland you see you see the addition of sugar to chocolate. People would, would have the raw cacao with spice with chiles or spice with herbs or spice with, uh, you know, spices like allspice. And this is how you would eat it. It was a, such an important thing because it connected you to the gods. And the way to make it was that you had to have a beautiful froth on top of it. If you had the froth, then that was the spirit of the cacao mm. talking. And in Mexico, corn is king, but chocolate is right next to it because it's so super important. It was used as money to trade. Um, it's been used as medicine. In the Caribbean, is, there's a long story about how milk was eventually added to it, and then that was sold to, to Nestle, and now we have milk chocolate. Right. But the story of chocolate is so, so long, so diverse. I mean, how many times have you, in, in, the, in your life, have you said, I need chocolate? Uh, Every get away single from me. I need day, chocolate. right? You know, it's that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and it's powerful, too. I mean, raw so cacao is insane. So this specific chocolate does have a very distinct taste that's different from other chocolates. It's a, well, so it's a, it's a little bit more bitter to start with, okay. but then you start adding those other ingredients. So like I said, it's already sweet. It's already okay. cinnamony. So when you're drinking this hot or cold, you're going to have this like beautiful sensation of this like, man, this is hitting all those notes that, that I need. Um, and so 
There's the beginning of yeah. chocolate. And then one of the last touches, we don't have it because we used it, is the honey. And in Mexico, we have this beautiful honey from a bee called Melipona. Uh, because people believe that the Europeans brought everything. Like we had nothing in Mexico, they brought everything, right? So we had our own bee that's native to Yucatan. It's called Melipona. It's a small bee that has no stinger. And that's where the Maya used to harvest the honey from. They used the honey to make mead, called balche, to drink. Uh, use it as medicine, as a, as a natural sweetener. So honey is a big part that goes into the mole to tune it at the end. Uh, and then we have some herbs. We have a tomillo or thyme. Uh, we have our bread and our tortillas that go in the mole. Uh, stale bread is fine. And then tortillas, we're going to toast them a bit and throw them in the blender when we make the mole. This is just to bind everything together, like a glue to make the whole mole together. Right. So again, you know, we have just a maybe three Mexican ingredients here and the rest are from all over the world. So mole poblano not only being the most important mole of all in Mexico, like the crown jewel of moles, it's a combination of efforts from all over the world. And you guys from Africa have a big contribution to the sauce through the via the plantains, the garlic. The, uh, sauce, the bene seeds. Yeah, so and thanks. So yeah. Let's, let's talk a little bit. So here we have the actual mole that I made. Um, I made this more like a paste so it was easier to bring with. And in Mexico, you'll see this sold like this everywhere because it's just easier to buy it. You take it home, you add a little bit of chicken stock or vegetable stock, and you thin it down, and then you can cook, you know, you cook it with your, your proteins or without. I prefer most of my stuff with vegetables, but it's, it's really how you like it. Um, and every one of these things needs, needs love in its own way. And so that's why the moles, specifically this one, can take up to an entire day to, to make. And f further than that, it... It's really not even good until like the fifth day, you know. I mean, it's great the first day, but by the fifth day, mm -hmm. it's fantastic. And so in Mexico, you might have a wedding that lasts a whole week, and you'll be serving the mole all week, but it's at its best when it's at, at, a, at about a five, five days. Um, I was going to ask, so is that process like a slow cooking, you know, just stewing on the side? Uh, well, no, it's, it's, it's the same. So like, okay, sesame seeds, these need to be toasted on the comal by themselves. These chiles need to be toasted, but not to the point where they're burnt. Right. The seeds need to be taken out, save those. There's, a, I mean, another thing, char it, and now you have a chili seed ash, and you mix it with salt, and you have a silly chili seed ash salt, and that's fantastic on, on like a ceviche, like a, you know, a raw fish preparation. But you'll uh, toast these to get the, the oils to come out and, and really become savory. And some, some, very, uh, some people that are just very specific about what they do will let them rest in a container for days. And then the flavor really starts to develop. Um, then you move on to the nuts. Again, lightly toasted, peeled. If you're making a mole blanco, or a white mole, or a mole de novia, the bride's mole, which is even more white, you have to take the skin off of these very And it's a, it's a pain in the butt. Very diligent. It's really, yeah, you have to sit there in your kitchen with your mom and with a spoon and like slowly peel the skins of the, of the pecans. Yeah. It's a process. And, and same thing with the pumpkin seeds. Tomatoes, we're gonna, we would char these and break them down. The one that we didn't have because I couldn't bring it with me and we couldn't find it here were tomatillos, which is a green version of this. It's not actually a tomato, but it's more of a gooseberry, right? right. Um, but tomatillos is like a very important part of this dish. It's going to add a little bit more acidity. It helps bind everything together. It gives it a beautiful viscosity. Uh, these would get either get gently fried in oil. I prefer not to use any oils when I'm making moles. This one, my, I might just reconstitute it with some water. Uh, seeds toasted, 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 thrown in at the end with the chocolate. Once the whole mole is cooked and it's, it's in its liquid form, you start to add the chocolate and stir it in very slowly and it changes color and it, and it becomes alive. Uh, same thing with the tortillas. We're gonna, we would char these into a tostada. These are not the tortillas that I'm used to. These are the ones that we could find here. Uh, they have a lot of preservatives in them and they have, you know, they're kind of crumbly. But a, a good corn tortilla, which is life, it should be three ingredients. It should be the corn, the nixtamal or the cal, and water. And that is a whole process. For over 5,000 years, Mesoamericans have been cooking hard corn that has been dried. You cook it in an alkaline solution like ash or cal, uh, um, limestone. Mm -hmm. right? And that creates a, a process that takes, strips the corn. Pericap is a thin skin that makes it indigestible and then allows the water to, to go into the, into the corn itself and at a molecular level, things are changing. The calcium is increased, the niacin is increased, uh, B vitamins are, are increased. And so when you're a civilization that it's very hard to, have to, to go to a store and just buy a steak for dinner or a chicken, you have to find your protein somehow. And this, was, this sustained civilizations for thousands of years, and the recipe has not changed. 
your tortilla should go bad in about a two or three days. You know, like it should go bad, and that's how you know it's a good tortilla. You right, know? right. Of course, you know, hopefully you eat it before it went bad, and you don't have to find out. But the whole point is that it shouldn't have so many preservatives in it. And every corn is so different. It, the recipes for cooking that corn in that alkaline solution differ all the time. It's such a process. It's, it's very difficult to make it as part of a, in the restaurant, along with everything else, because you need somebody that's really dedicated to it. You need the right tools for it. Um, and you need somebody that's gonna wake up at two, three o'clock in the morning that's like, oh man, is this thing sitting in the, in the, in the solution 30 minutes too long? Because yeah, that's, that's gonna me. change everything. It's gonna change everything. Um, so all these ingredients mashed up together look like this, like, yeah. a, like a paste, right? This is the, like the recado for the mole, right? So it's a paste that we're gonna hydrate with, with stock, vegetable stock, chicken stock in a pot and it's gonna look just like that. It's velvety and smooth and it's just outstanding. We have, uh, have some samples to try. Yes, yes we do. We do and have some samples. I know, this is where you guys are excited. You want chop, Abby? Stand up. up, that's why we're here. Okay. Uh, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna choose the people who get the samples to try. So whoever was smiling at me the most will get a sample, because I'm partial. Pardon, pardon me, and, and I don't mean to step on your toes here. I know they told us just a handful of people, oh. but I told them I want as many people to try this as possible. I don't want you guys to leave here without knowing what a mole is. So okay. we brought enough okay. Okay. for I think every, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, but okay. we had to do it that way. They are nice, I'm not. So who wants mole? Come up, let's Okay, no, 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 nobody get up. Nobody get up, nobody gets up. Trust me, let me do this. <laughs> nobody gets up. This is how we're going to do it. The ushers are going to pass around the pole. Because you know how we do our thing in Nigeria, that fights the device. So everybody just sit down, all right? <laughs> You're right. Nobody stand up. You're right. Getting through the front door was, <laughs> was mad, chaos. All right, so come on over here, guys. Come help us out. So, uh, yeah, so first of all, thank you to GTCO Bank for having us. It's been a pleasure visiting your country. It's absolutely beautiful. Super vibrant. Love the music, by the way. The food is incredible. So we're uh, going to have, uh, we have a few, few questions yes. while we're doing the serving. Uh, please put your hand up if you would like to ask a question. Hands up for questions. All I know you questions. guys want to eat. We have a question over there. Question. We have a question over there. Can I get a mic? Okay, let's start over there. And then can I get another mic on the other side, please? Okay, please go ahead. Uh, could you go over the, what you said about onions, making charred onions and then using it to sprinkle on food like that, like some of the so how to do that? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The onion ash. Oh yeah, yeah, the onion ash. So uh, break it down in, into, the, into the, the petals of the onion so that you have more surface area that's actually getting cooked. Put it on a sheet pan, spread it out so that it's not like onion on top of onion. And as high as your oven goes, 500 is most of them, uh, Fahrenheit. And just let it go until it's charred black and ash. It's gonna take about, oh, it's about 45 minutes maybe. Um, it's crazy to use the oven at, the, at that temperature. And so, you know, it's like, the, but if, it'll ha your oven can handle it, I'm pretty sure. Uh, the house is going to smell a little bit strong for a little bit, but when it's done, the flavor has toned down. It's a great ingredient. It's going to keep all year in an airtight container. And when you're ready to use it, the best thing to do, maybe you have uh, one of those tea diffusers or a strainer, a very, small, a very uh, a fine mesh strainer. You put it in there and just kind of just tap it on the sides, and it's just going to rain this ash on top of your stuff. And you have like, say you made a beautiful dish and it's covered in a sauce and you just need that little extra element. It's going to take it there. And it's not going to taste burnt. It's going to it taste fantastic. There's a whole thing of, there is a time when you're charring food that it does taste charred, but if you take it a little bit further, then it becomes completely different. The Mesoamericans, the Aztecs specifically, used that as a way of preservation before refrigerators, before fats were involved. Uh, charring foods was a way of preserving food. So. All right, thank you. Next question, please. Over there, on the, uh, in the front, please. I think the easiest way is Amazon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a little bit easier. When we started the restaurant, it was really hard to get quality chiles. Uh, it took years of making relationships and finding people. And now we have somebody that, that actually ha helps us import them. Because some of them are so specific, like the chile chilhualque negro from Oaxaca is grown in 20 hectares in the entire world. Chile chilhualque means the old chile in the Aztec language. Um, and it's, it's precious in, in, in how, how complex it is, like, like licorice and coffee and raisins and chocolate. And it's made for very specific moles 
and it's very hard to get. So you can't find that one on Amazon, don't ask. But <laughs> most peppers you can, at least to get you started. And like I said, chipotle, pasilla, ancho, you'll, it'll take you a long way. You get those together, you find variations of it, levels of how you like it, and getting to know them will help you understand where you're going to go with the dish. Easy peasy after that. So find someone coming from America for you. Yeah, and if you find smoky ones, go with the smoky ones. They're so good. <laughs> All right, can we, the question over by uh, the lady with the hat, please. Um, about the chilies, you said it was from the fresh green. Then yes. Then it's dry, then it's yes. um, smoked. Through to the process, does it get intensified, the hotness? Um, or does it get some of, them, some of them do, some of them don't. The chile serrano is already very spicy. And just as a side note, it's the only chile you don't take the seeds out of because they're so small, this, so it's almost like this a sin. Is, this is... Yeah, but that one gets a little bit spicier when it's smoked. It's called pico de, pa de pájaro, or bird's beak. That's the chile serrano. Uh, and they have so many different names. I mean, when they're ripe, when they're green, when they're red, when they're dried, when they're smoked, their name just changes. And so early on when I, was, when I started with the restaurant, and it was very confusing to figure out, like, well, what is this chile? I've never heard of it. Turns out it was just a variation of one of the other chiles we were already using. And so, yeah. All right. Hope that answers your question. We have a question in the back. Can you please put your hands up so I know how many more questions we can take? Uh, this is the last round I'm going to ask. A uh, lady in the white. Anybody else? Over okay, here. Last, last question. Yeah. Okay, Over there in the back. Yes, please. Is, go ahead. is it possible to have all these ingredients in a particular dish, or it comes in varieties? Is all the ingredients that we have on the table now. Is it possible we have everything in a particular dish in just one dish? Yeah, yes, yeah. that's, that's it right there. Yeah, right here. You got to try it. So, mole yeah. poblano. All of this is in there. Yeah, so everything that's here, yeah, it's in here. Yeah. So, that's, so, we broke it down into ingredients. You could see how complex the whole thing with mole is. And you're not now, seeing the honey and you're not seeing the tomatillos. The tomatillos. Yeah. Now, th in Mexico, we have dozens of different moles. This is just one, right. which we think is the most important one because of the complexities, the story behind it, and then how many ingredients from all over the world it takes to make. Right? In Oaxaca, which is a state in the Pacific coast of Mexico, is not of the land of the seven moles because they have seven moles that are just from Oaxaca. Right? This one's from Puebla, and then we have pipianes from different parts of the country. Right? But this is the, what we think is the most important historically and culturally. Yeah. This is one mole right here. This is mole de cacahuate. Peanut mole, right there. Peanuts, cinnamon, cloves, a smoky chile, garlic, onion, tomato. That's all you need. Everything charred, toasted, reconstituted blended and you have peanut mole which is one of the an incredible mole that goes really nicely with turkeys and this is another mole pipian yeah so take this out take and this the, out. pretend this is a tomatillo <laughs> and these would be fresh instead of dried and now you have a different mole so now it's three moles just in like yep. what's going on here right so it's like a puzzle you can make and take different uh, elements of moles to make another mole right when when we opened the restaurant I didn't have the opportunity to visit every state yes. in Mexico and try every single mole. It became this quest of, well, I want to make these things, but I don't really know what they're supposed to taste like. So it became the quest of understanding what each one of these ingredients yes, needed, okay. wanted, just, where it wanted to go, and who it was really good friends with. And so that's how we started making moles. One of my favorites is the Chilhualque Negro, I mean, it's the uh, Recado Negro or the Mole Negro, where you have to char these chiles Again, you char them all the way until they're completely black. You take the seeds out and you char those separately in a pan. Uh, you char all the rest of your ingredients and you have a beautiful black lacquer mole that is just is so sexy on, on, on any kind of dish. If you can pull that off, like, it's tops. It's so shiny. Yeah. It's just very unique mole from Mexico. I, I mean, it's, at the end of the day, it really is art and you guys have taken us through. I mean, I've learned so much about plantain today. Uh, we have one question there in the white. My, Mike? Okay, oh, no, 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 let's go to the lady in the white, please. Put your hand up. Yeah, there you go, so they can <laughs> see you. And I believe this is the last question we can take. We've run out of time, so. Okay, hi, um, so I'm really curious as to how you guys um, cook your plantain. So do you fry, do you boil it, do you roast it, do you smoke it, how Yes, you... okay. all of it. Usually not fried so much because that's, that's more of a uh, Caribbean or Puerto Rican, and it's not necessarily what we're doing at the restaurant, but yes to the rest of it. In all kinds of fashions, we've made desserts out of it, drinks out of it, um, 
Now we had a really cool dish with the uh, with the crawfish recently. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a dish that was based on, on the jungles in uh, Chiapas, uh, La Condona jungle, one of the largest jungles in that area. And it was a puree of plantains that had to be silky smooth because we do fine dining, so it had to be beautiful every time. Uh, with black beans, and that combination is just insane. And then crawfish that were cooked in a butter that that was poached with chiles on a on a huarache, which, which is a uh, just another shape. Uh, for, for shaping masa, corn masa. And then we put it inside of a box that my wife helped me make, actually, she's right here. But she helped me, it's a box that when it sits the table, you push a button and you open it up and it has a recording of jungle sounds. And so you're like, what's happening? It was pretty cool. Hope that answered your question. Excuse me, chef. Excuse me, chef. Uh, time check for me, please. Okay, we have time for questions. Okay, over there on the left, we have two questions. One, two, three. And then one here, and then that's it. Go, go more, more. Microphone, who has a microphone, more, please? More, more. Uh, can you please give the microphone to the next person so the process moves She's faster? Right okay, all hello. Right, go ahead. Yeah, okay, my question is, all these things you right displayed, top, cover it all. do you have any cookbook or recipe book or something where we can learn how to use them to make Mexican it, foods? It's in the works, but Excuse I'll give you my email. If you really have a question and you want a recipe, help with the recipe, we'll help you out. I'll okay. give it to you. Do I get email now? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, before you guys leave, come up, give your yeah. email, and wait, stay wait, in wait, touch. Wait. We'd or love to send you recipes. Is your email on your Instagram page? No. Okay, it's but, not. Or hit us up on the Instagrams, too. That you works can too. hit them up yeah. on Instagram. That's easier, actually. Um, I will go ahead and get that out for you. Uh, over there on the left, please. Good evening. Hello. Sorry, in Nigeria now that we're hanging, most of all, we get to use Maggi and salt. Most common thing that we get to use. So I'm really surprised and shocked that everything you gather together, because I cannot do without my gear and salt if I'm cooking. So I'm really surprised seeing all these things combined together. I didn't really see a particular, like um, a spicy stuff, aside from all these ones you've been. Can we settle down, please? Uh, everyone will get the food. Let's make sure that we're paying attention to our questions so we can. So basically what she's saying is that she's, you know, enamored by the fact that you guys have cooked without maggi and salt right and maggi and salt maggi is maggi. basically yeah so she's asking how is it going to taste considering the fact that she's grown up only using maggi yeah well i think uh in mexico we use maggi cubes bouillon all those things to cut the time it requires to make the food right my mom i have to make chicken stock instead of bracing chicken thighs and chicken legs and she would just throw a cube of maggi in right and then boom you have chicken stock or the bouillon that has tomatoes, now you have a, a, a tomato chicken consomme. Well, at the restaurant, it just takes longer, right? It takes, it's more patience, going through the motions of making everything, everything right. At the restaurant, we make all the stocks from scratch, vegetable stocks, chicken stocks, beef stocks. We could use cubes, but it's better to go the long way and get it done. And, right? and I just want to realize, they didn't use any bouillon cube and it tastes amazing, right? For those of you who've tasted, it tastes, a1. It just shows you that there's so much to learn, which is why we're having this master class. Right. It's that balance uh, of sweet, savory, just those Baroque influences hitting yep. you all at once. All right. So last question. Who has the microphone? Uh, who has the microphone? No, who has the microphone that's asking a question, please? Okay. So we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much. You guys give our chefs a round of applause. Chef Diego and Rico for coming all the way from Thank San Antonio and giving us a history lesson of the beauty of ingredients. Now we know that we can cook without bouillon cube and we can make our food taste amazing. I hope you guys are sharing amongst yourselves. Remember, you can follow them on Instagram if you would like to contact them and find out and ask them a few more questions as well. Um, and do you guys have any final words? Yeah, we'll see you next year, hopefully. Yeah. We'd love to come back and hang out with everybody here. So. We'd love to see you. <laughs> So we just finished the masterclass with Chef Diego and Rico, and I have to say, I felt like I learned so much today. Thank you guys for truly showing us the beauty in ingredients. You know, a lot of times when we're cooking, we don't really think about what is going in. We're just like, I'm putting a tomato here, I'm putting it. But the history, that was absolutely beautiful. Talk to us about, you know, how you guys went on this journey of understanding ingredients that we're putting in cooking. I think that... It's just part of the mission of the restaurant. Part of the mission of the restaurant has always been to rescue, to preserve, to promote Mexican gastronomy. So many people get stuck in that whole Tex-Mex vision of that, this is it, burritos and enchiladas, you know. And we wanted to expand on that. And the only way to do that is to get to understand where it came from. 
Yeah, it's such a special thing. Uh, Mexican food has gone diluted through the years. You know, Tex-Mex and cheeses, and so we try to really bring it up to a pedestal and put it back in its rightful place among the great cuisines of the world, you know? So that's, uh, that's the, the, our biggest mission. And, you know, I can't imagine, because in so many ways, you guys are based in an area in America where people just think about Mexican food and they're like, oh, it's Tex-Mex. You know, what's been that experience when you're trying to change people's minds and really show them that, like, you know, Mexican food is more than eating a taco? There, there's no resistance to it. I, you know, we live in an area where Tex-Mex is king. Yeah, in San Antonio, South Texas, that's, that's what's up. But people really re react and respond well to the fact that now they're learning, like, I didn't know this was Mexican. I didn't know that this was that and where it came from. And the best thing that can ever happen to us at the restaurant is when somebody cries because <laughs> they remember or tasted something that they haven't had since they were children. Oh, man. I can't imagine. You know, we talked a little bit about plantain, and you can see how excited everyone got. I think what's really fascinating is seeing how plantain is eaten in a savory way in, you know, your part of the world. Um, it would be interesting to kind of see a marriage of how we eat it, which we eat it very simple. You know, we just fry it or we boil it, and we do have a porridge as well. But I saw on your Instagram that you said Nigerian food should be where Indian food is. Talk to us about that. What is it about the flavor yeah, that really hits you? Yeah, it's uh, Nigerian food should be in, in those pedestals of great cuisines like, you know, Indian food, Mexican food, uh, food, food that has a lot of bold flavors right. and spice, right? So it should be its own category amongst the, the kings of cuisine in the world. And Nigerian food, you know, we've had it, you know, since we got here yesterday and it's so special. It's so delicious. You just can't stop eating, you know, jollof rice and we had the suya <laughs> last night and it's so bold and courageous and, and it should be celebrated amongst the great kitchens of the world, cuisines of the world. You know? oh, that's amazing to hear. You know, it's really interesting because we were talking about jollof rice and I know you got, you know, even in Southern America, there's a type of rice that you guys mm -hmm. eat that's very similar. It looks like jollof rice, different flavors. And earlier you had said that Mexican and Nigerian food have a lot of um, yeah. relationship. Yeah. Um, so it would be really cool to see what kind of collaborations that could happen. Thank you guys so much Thank for you. coming all the way and for just enlightening us. This was absolutely, absolutely amazing. Right. How to really Huge thanks to GTCO today. Bank. Thanks for having us. And, and uh, Nigeria, guys. lots of love, and we can't wait to come back. Woo! Woo! All right. All right, guys, that's it. So make sure that you're here for the next masterclass. It's still going on. Uh, this is the GTCO Food and Drink. Love you.